In this seminar, we will uh, look at the A discipleship strategy. There are many discipleship strategies, but this one uh, is the one that uh, I believe uh, brings it in a very simple way on one sheet of paper um, the full cycle of discipleship and a lot of the learning that you've done in the discipleship unit can be summarized in a, in a graphic form with this one. It provides a diagram to follow. Uh, it's quite simple. You will make sense of it as we go through it. It is very insightful. It uh, covers the full life cycle of disciple making. So you'll be able to understand a lot of how in each stage uh, the disciple feels and behaves. And it's very simple to follow. So hopefully you will make sense of it. Now, the greatest leader uh, that ever lived was Jesus Christ. But what people don't realize is that he was also the great leadership model in making leaders. He was the greatest discipler as well. Not only was a good he was a good leader, but he was able to make disciples just as good as he was in the sense he wanted people to replicate uh, him or he wanted to be replicated in other people. So this is uh, the full discipleship strategy. And what we'll do today, we'll take it in each batch. So this is the full uh, diagram, but we will break it down in phases. So there are four phases in it, and I will explain to you each phase. Uh, just remember that in the middle there you have a heart, which means that everything we do here in being a disciple and making disciples is done in a loving relationship one-on-one. -on -one. So the heart stands for a loving relationship one-on-one. -on -one. So everything comes together in loving uh, the Lord and loving one another. Uh, if the relationship is centered on love, then it, it is built solidly. So in phase one, um, we have... So Jesus calls people to come and follow him, basically. So that is the call that, that Jesus makes on the people to follow him and the disciple just uh, responds to that call he is very enthusiastic so the enthusiasm is quite high there's very there's a lot of confidence he's confident oh I can do this I can follow the leader I want to do this this is basically like an apprentice getting a new apprenticeship he's highly um, enthusiastic about it he's confident I can do this I want to do this he hasn't got much experience, the experience is very low, the competence is very low. But on the other hand, the leader, the discipler, requires a lot of direction to give to the disciple. And he needs to be a good example, a good model for the disciple. At this stage, he doesn't need any consensus, so he doesn't need to negotiate anything with the disciple. And there's not a lot of explanation needed at this stage, but more modeling. So low consensus, low explanation, but a lot of high direction and high example. At, the, at this phase, the simplicity is in, the, in these four words, I do, you watch, basically. Uh, in this phase, in phase one, the, the leader teaches the disciple the what about the skill about being a disciple. The disciple is a servant. And the leader teaches him the theory. It's pretty much explaining to him what it means to follow him. How to be a servant, how to be an apprentice. If anyone serves me, says the Lord, he must follow me. And what I am there will my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So the call is to serve in the first instance. This is also a testing ground. If somebody can serve, then they can truly become disciples. So, in that first phase, uh, the disciple learns the what about the business, the theory about the business. In the second phase, this is when uh, the disciple basically, when the rubber hits the road and the disciple says, what did I sign up for? Why did I leave my boat? Why did I leave my job? Why did I say I will? Why did I jump on board? Because this is not for me. They're low in enthusiasm. They're low in confidence. 
I don't have any experience, no confidence. And this is where the leader has to work the hardest. He has to have high direction, high discussion, high example, high accessibility. So he has to point the way to show the vision, but we're going somewhere, you are part of this, come along, buy in this vision, you know, even though you don't feel like it, even though you feel discouraged, just hear me out. Let's talk about it. That's the discussion. Let me understand you. Let me explain to you. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's process this together. And follow me. I mean, look at me. Just learn from me. Let's do this together. Look at what I do, and then you do it as well. And look, I am available. That's accessibility. You can call me day, night. You can call me in the morning. You can call me in the evening. This is one of the great things that I liked about Dr. Bob. You know, if I email him or SMS him, I always receive the message back. I always receive the call back. Being available is, is very important, being accessible. Most uh, discipleship programs or most discipleship fails here. So in a, in a, in a discipleship relationship, this is where most of the time it, it, it comes apart in phase two. Because the disciple is so disillusioned and uh, with a lack of orientation. And unless the leader steps in and invests so much of the energy, this is where the leader has to work the highest, the, the most in phase two. This is because the disciple has lost all the confidence. So the only way you can build disciples and make disciples is to be very, very alert in this stage and work very close with the people. And in a sense, you still do most of the work and you get them to come alongside you and help. And that's, that's the summary there. I do you help. And you're, you're reiterating that. Look, just look at me. I'm doing it. Just come along. Come along, come along. Let's talk about it. So that's, that's what's happening in phase two. In phase two, the leader is showing the how of the business. And the... Uh, uh, this is where the student or the apprentice or the disciple becomes a friend. In John 15, 15, it says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So when somebody becomes a friend, he learns the trade. In the first stage, he only learned the theory, but now because he was watching, he was part of the process, he is learning the skills of the trade. He is learning the skills of being a disciple, a follower. So now he becomes a friend of the leader. So that's what happens in phase two. As I said, in phase two, the disciple is very low, so he needs that friendship from the leadership. So the leader has to make himself a friend. Remember, Jesus was even a friend of sinners. That's how, you know, how much he reached out to people so he can lift them up. In phase three, uh, the disciple begins to get a bit of an identity. Uh, he's gone through the deepest of the valleys, and now he's coming gradually. Everything is beginning to increase. The enthusiasm is beginning to grow. The confidence is growing. They're not high yet, but they're growing. The experience begins to grow. There's some competence coming through. The leader doesn't need to give them much direction anymore because they already bought into that. Now the leader has to reach a way of consensus. He's talking to the disciple. And he's saying, well, what do you think we should do here? How would you tackle this? Should we go that way? Okay, <coughs> try it that way. So there's consensus, there's discussion. They are communicating. He's not just telling, he's not just directing, but he's saying, let's talk about this. What do you think would work best? What did you see me do? How did we do it before? How did Jesus do it? You know? And the accessibility is still high because in this phase, the disciple is still trialing things. He's testing things. So he's saying, okay, I went there and I did that. I prayed for that person and nothing happened. It's just like the disciples came back to Jesus and you know, they said, well, this... this you know, we can't, we can't perform here, you know. And then Jesus says, well, you need fasting and prayer, these kind of demons, you know. So there's a lot of accessibility required at this phase as well. 
In this phase, in phase three, uh, the disciple understands the why about the business. So here he becomes a son. So remember he was a servant, then a friend, and now he's a child, he's a son of the leader, a spiritual son. Here he understands why we're doing what we're doing. He actually understands the business. Jesus said to them, children, do you have some, uh, any fish? They answered him, no. So Jesus is calling them now sons, children. Now, you only give the secrets of your business to your son. You may teach the trade to a friend, to your apprentice, to your servant. You only tell them the theory and bits and pieces. To a friend, you actually give them the trade skills. But only an, a son understands why you're doing the business. Why you're running the business. Only they understand the business. So that is passed only to the son. And this happens in phase three. And here, uh, you see, the, the summary is, you do, I help. You do, I help. In uh, phase four, in the last stage, this is where the disciple is reaching uh, a place of high in everything, high enthusiasm, high confidence. He's got the experience now, he has the competence, he can make decisions, he's confident about it, he has done the hard work, he knows what needs to be done. The leader doesn't need to direct him anymore, doesn't really need to be an example for him anymore. There's still discussion, there's still explanation, there's still consensus. This is where they sit down and they plan things, they negotiate things, they talk about things. So I would say that in my relationship, let's say with Dr. Bob Chapman, we are a lot, we're spending most of our time now at this phase. Where we, you know, he still explains to me, there's still consensus, but he allows me to make the decisions. Do you understand? He, we just bounce ideas off each other, we talk to him. You know, he, he has an expectation that he doesn't need to motivate me. You know, you know you've reached a level of maturity when you no longer need motivation, external motivation. That's when you know you are a disciple. So that's a good test. When you no longer need to be motivated by others, when you are motivated internally and you have that passion inside of you, that's when you reach a level of maturity. Also confidence, you know who you are, you have the identity, you can go forward. You have some experience and that's growing, ever increasing, and this competence. You can actually do the work. And at this stage is saying, well, now you do it and I watch you do it. It's basically I step back and I watch you do it. Now you're in the arena. You're doing it. And in this phase, we're no longer asking the what, the how, and the why. We're asking the whom. Who will you father? Who will you take now the process from the beginning? Whom will you take on board to disciple? You are becoming a leader. You are becoming a spiritual father. Who will you pass on this legacy to? Now it's about the legacy. Before it was about the theory, the trade, the business. Now it's leaving a legacy behind. You're taking it to a strategic level where you want to make disciples yourself. And this is what we learn in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here we see four generations. Paul is teaching Timothy for four generations. He's actually teaching him legacy. So he's saying, what you, second generation, have heard me, the first generation, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. So Paul to Timothy, generation one to generation two, Timothy to faithful men, generation two to generation three, who will be able to teach others, generation three to generation four. So what Paul is teaching today, he's actually teaching for four generations. So make sure that the way you present, the way you disciple people, you disciple and instill in them so much passion and so much competence and so much accessibility and so much leadership that they are able to duplicate this at least to the fourth generation. So you've got to inspire them to inspire others. Your passion must flow through. Your competence must flow through. So be very careful when you 
there's a huge responsibility as a leader to disciple other people. You disciple for legacy. You disciple and equip people so they're able to, to move to the next and next and next stage. And this is the full cycle now, and you have that as a printed copy as well. So you see how it all fits together. You do I watch, I do you help, you do I help in phase three, you do I watch in phase four. And then you do what I did, and the cycle begins again. So you basically duplicate that. Now this can take two years, can take one year, can take three years, depending you know, who you journey with. And, but the idea is to carry on and always have this. So it's good to have a printed copy, somewhere handy, look at it. And as I said earlier, this is all done in a loving relationship, one-on-one. -on -one. This is not done in a classroom. This is not done in a, for a teaching from the pulpit. This is done at coffee, in prayer, in mission, in ministry, in golf, in tennis, in wherever and whatever you guys do. This is done life on life. That's the only way you can do it. That's the only way people grow. So you basically have everything there. Remember in the first phase, it's about what, then how you do it, the trade, why you do it, and whom you will pass on the bat into the legacy on, so this can carry around. So have this handy, and you can also teach this strategy to other people as well. So it's, it's actually very good to take the your disciples on this journey and say, look, in this discipleship strategy we're about here. Understand that in the second phase it will be like this, but look what's waiting for us as well. And then if you teach them as you move through the process, they will be able to do the same and the same and the same. And if you do two, three times this, this, uh, let's say with two or three people, then hopefully they'll do the same and the ripple effect will be massive. So I just pray that this discipleship strategy will be useful to you, that you will take it on board, and uh, you will make many, many disciples, just as Jesus did. Be blessed. Amen.